Hey, Matt. Hey, Marcus. How are you? I'm okay. Did you hear what the uh, Bank of Canada had to say today? I, I did. I know that they put out a multi-page report today. That's about it. You told me on, on the, your drive-in. It's called the Monetary Policy Report. They were issued one in January as well, right? Yeah, they happen to do that. That's kind of their job. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a quarterly report? It's an every time they meet report. Yeah, I think it comes out every every quarter. Why do you ask me such difficult questions? <laughs> Just showing that we know about as much of it as. Uh... <laughs> no, no. It's um, every time they're. It's a quarterly report that comes out. They can meet whenever they want. So, like, usually there's a prescribed set of dates for meetings. But if something you know really serious is going on, they will meet. Uh, but usually the dates for their meetings are set in advance, and the monetary policy reports come out quarterly. In this case the report kind of, uh, it actually had a lot to say and, um, a lot of, a lot of pieces of information that relate to some of the things we've been speaking about on the podcast, obviously, because we talk about them constantly. Uh, what I found, uh, interesting was number one, they kind of slapped the government of Canada's hands to say that the monetary policy report does mention the increased spending from the federal government, um, which is inflationary, which we've discussed uh, recently, like just on the last episode, I believe a week ago. Um, Another piece uh, is, and I heard the former governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polos, talk about it just after the monetary policy report was released, uh, is the, um, is the kind of psychology of inflation and the importance that it's playing into inflation. So inflation expectations are high. And as a result, inflation persists. Is that because people are uh, like spending more or spending? Is that consumer habits? I mean, or like what brings that expectation? Just people, like people's people have come to, understand that prices are higher and higher as such they continue to modify their behavior and anticipate higher and higher prices that doesn't change until the economy shifts and so that's not just consumer habits it's uh corporations governments and stuff like that business all, spending all yeah. along the board but really like what we're seeing we continue to see strong labor uh which is a problem Strong labor, if you remember, we spoke about it the last monetary policy report. Strong labor is something that can allow inflation to sneak in and become more persistent in the economy. So if you have strong labor and strong labor utilization, well, then you have a bit of an issue because people need to be paid more. Labor becomes more expensive. Those costs now become more ingrained in products and services. And as a result, inflation is harder to kind of strip out of the economy. So the report does discuss uh, that. Listen, for sure, I think the takeaway from the report is the Bank of Canada is not going to change interest rates in 2023. There's no half a point cut coming. The market continues to anticipate it, right? We talk about the behavior of the market. The market comes in and says, okay, Uh, No matter what they really said, you know, look at what's going on in the overall market and they're going to have to cut before they say. But the Bank of Canada or the Federal Reserve, because most people are speaking about the Federal Reserve, comes back out and says, no, no, we're not changing anything. We are not. We're going to leave interest rates where they are. Well, that was evident in today's monetary policy report. Interest rates are going to be high until a year that ends in a four. Um, they're going to be where they are at, at the very least. Um, and they reference, you know, a few different reasons for that. One of which is another thing we talk about a lot on this podcast. The effects of increased interest rates haven't fully been borne out into the economy yet. I was just about to say, we used to talk about that about a year ago, that you would see it with, lagging effects a, a year for it to policy. happen. And then yeah. the whole year took, we took increases the whole year. So we've got to see that whole year play out as well, right? Yeah. So, and I think a problem, an, a, a, like an issue here that may be exacerbating that is that a lot of, 
a lot. All of the Canadian banks have taken on this new game plan of letting mortgages run. So you saw it with CIBC um, in their most recent quarterly report. You see it now with TD Bank and RBC. I don't know if you heard like you love TikTok. So like there's so many TikTok videos of people talking about the demise of TD Bank and the number of short sellers that are targeting the bank. Well, the reason why the banks are being targeted, uh, which I don't, I don't see the short playing out, but the reason why the banks are being targeted is they have these massive portfolios of mortgages. And by most estimations, 20% of the mortgages in their portfolios are not servicing the interest on the mortgage on a month over month basis. It's a huge, that's a huge number. So let, let's let, like, what does that do? Right. If your mortgage lender says, just keep paying what you were paying, we'll take care of the rest. It means that your mortgage balance is increasing month over month, but they're not really advertising that to you. They're just saying, you know, okay, Matt, you have a million dollar mortgage. Your payment on your million dollar mortgage two years ago was, you know, uh, geez, it would have been $15,000 a year, right? 1.5% on yeah. a variable rate. And your payment now is 6%, $60,000. Every year, the equity in your home is being eroded by the difference between those two numbers. So you are now adding $45,000 to your debt on a month over month basis, significant amount, oh, sorry, on an annual basis. Eventually that has to stop. It has to stop for psychologically, the person that has the debt is going to say, geez, like I just can't afford to keep adding this much debt to my balance sheet. And for the lender, it's going to change because at a certain point, the lender is going to say, geez, the amount of debt we've got on this property is too high. But what it does in the interim is it shores up the real estate market, right? It prevents those people from being motivated to have to sell because they can stay in their property, because they can still pay the same amount of interest on their mortgage. And it delays the impact of the interest rate hikes even further because really the debt servicing on their loan hasn't changed fundamentally. The same amount of money is going out of their wallet every month to service the debt. It's just that they are negative saving, right? They're spending their equity in addition to the payments that they're making. Yeah. So although it delays this excess supply that should be hitting the market, and we're seeing it right now in the spring market, it, it's just a question. So if the banks are the major pundits of the market, right? We can agree to that. Yep. The banks all have their economists, their equity strategists, so they are the ones that are making most of the predictions in the market on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. That means that the effects are bond yields change constantly, stock prices go up and down, and the banks have their hands right in there on a constant basis. And those banks believe, because the market is telling us, that the central banks are going to drop rates before the end of the year, right? That's what the market's telling us. Yep. 50 basis point cut before the uh, before December. but. If that is what their strategy and their playbook is telling them, and that's allowing them internally on their risk models to let mortgages run, read, to let the debt continue to accrue, what happens when they have to switch their risk model to account for interest rates that will stay higher for longer? And how will that impact what? they are doing with their residential mortgage holders, commercial mortgage holders. That could be a problem. So um, it's it's mentioned in the monetary policy report. If you want to pull up, I sent you those two charts. Yep. If you want to pull that up. So the uh, red line, I think, is variable rates. Yeah, red line, variable rates. Um, you can see that kind of heading into this, variable rates became extremely popular. Uh, and that was when the Bank of Canada told us that interest rates were going to stay extremely low for forever, basically. So everybody jumped into a variable rate. And then as interest rates started to climb, more and more people climbed out of the variable rates. 
and hopped into the one and the two year fixed rates. Everybody knows right now because of the inverted bond yield. I mean, I sound so stupid saying that. Not everybody knows, but bond yields are inverted, which means that lower, shorter term rates are higher than longer term rates because the market is anticipating a recession. As a result, Shorter mortgage rates are cheaper than longer mortgage rates. So more and more people are taking the one and the two year fixed rate product. That's the baby blue line, probably my favorite color. So the baby blue line, Marcus's favorite color, shows more and more Canadians jumping into these shorter fixed rates because they're cheaper than variable rates. And also because they're expecting, as the banks are expecting, remember, risk strategy, all these very smart people that get paid lots of money. The Bank of Canada is going to drop rates before the end of the year. And then you can see three and four year rates have also increased, but five year fixed rates have dropped because we've been told kind of time and time again that the um, five year fixed is not the way to go because of uh, the inverted bond yield. So what does this mean? It means that we're able to kind of kick the can down the road a little bit with these shorter term rates by muting the impact of transitioning from a low variable rate or fixed rate product into a you know less low shorter term product and kind of all those people are making a bet that like eventually the market is going to do much worse as a result bond yields will come down as a result fixed rate mortgages will come down um Go to the next one. Yeah. Go ahead. What were you going to say? So I, I heard you take you, one of your <laughs> long, deep breaths thinking. So uh, how much of this, it, you know, you, you said that people are expecting it and people, so this is, everybody is on the kind of waiting for it to play out. How much of this is the monetary policy is a, is a bluff so that people aren't expecting it? There's no bluff. Remember, the, the, the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve can't bluff anymore. Yeah. You, like, have you have you ever yeah. really played a serious game of poker? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. You can sit at a table and bluff people only so many times. Yeah. The Bank of or Canada you cried wolf, right? Yeah. The Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve have been sitting at this table. They started off by saying, "We're going to do whatever it takes to stop the uh, great sell-off in real estate to avoid a depression in 2008." They introduced new things like quantitative easing. Woohoo! And then they came out and said, interest, we're going to spend as much as we want. It won't matter because we won't cause inflation because COVID is the number one concern. Well, they were wrong again there. And then they came out and said, don't worry, this pesky little inflation number that we're seeing means nothing. It's going to be okay. And they were wrong again. At a certain point, They're just the drunk guy at the poker table that keeps going all in and they can't do it anymore. So they can't bluff anymore. The Bank of Canada can't, the Federal Reserve can't bluff and not follow through with what they say they're going to do. In 2008, 2009, I don't even remember, there was this saying called, everyone said, don't fight the Fed. I remember. Fed wants to pump money into the market. Don't fight the Fed. Go long equities. Everybody was like, but the system's broken. It doesn't make sense. Look at all the people that are losing money. These mortgage, uh, the securitized mortgage products are garbage. They're not going to work. Don't fight the Fed. Don't fight the Fed. Well, guess what? By assuming that the interest rates set by the central banks around the world are going to drop sooner than the end of the year, you're fighting it. You're fighting the Fed. And this just shows the expectation that the Bank of Canada is providing that mortgage costs are going to rise and they are going to stay elevated. And if you look at this chart, they are elevated into the start of 2025. Okay. So I don't know about you, but from here to 2025 seems like two years. And we have to ask ourselves, are the banks in Canada willing to continue to let 20% of their mortgage book accrue interest? Never mind, are they willing to? Are their shareholders willing to? And if they are not willing to, how will that impact real estate prices? This, let me ask you, Marcus, because I, when I... No more questions, Matt. <laughs> when I did dive into this and I saw the list of banks that are having this type of issue and this type of uh, conundrum, Scotiabank wasn't listed. and They're all, It's all the same. Every bank is the same. Every bank, you can l- pick them apart. They have a very, very similar makeup within... 
a small standard deviation. They are all the they all all the Canadian banks operate very similarly. So what I what I saw though is that the Scotia Bank issues a different type of variable where the payment changes month to month, and that has happened. Oh before. yeah, okay, that's a good point. Variable rate mortgages at Scotia Bank, but they're still offering remedies. Okay, right? so the number of more loans on, on their book with those remedies will start to increase, and. There is a financial services watchdog. I don't know what the name of it is. There's so many of them. I sent it to you in a link that was part of the budget, the Canadian budget, where they are putting in place mechanisms to provide leniency to Canadian mortgage holders. Read, the federal government is telling the banks, continue to accrue interest, right? So, and then I read somewhere else, like, you know what? The Canadian banks are going to listen. Because the reason why they're so profitable is their relationship with the federal government. Um, well, I think the Canadian banks are four times return four times more to shareholders than European banks, right? Like because it's not such a fragmented market. Read, it's an oligopoly. They are stronger. Uh, they won't have a run on deposits, and the federal bank will backstop them. So when the federal bank, fe- sorry, the federal government will backstop them. So when the federal government says to the Canadian banks, you better be nice to your borrowers, they listen. The, the banks listen, which I don't think you get in something like a free market economy. <laughs> it's a very good point, Marcus. It's a very good point. So I believe that we have a guest in today's show, right? Yeah. So you don't want to talk about this report anymore? <laughs> okay, so let's roll in. We've got a great guest today. Uh, Peter Papatsik is here from the Papatsik team. Uh, fabulous sellers of luxury real estate. And we're going to get his take on the market. Welcome. Thank you, Marcus. Great to have you on here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you, everyone. I mean, yeah. you don't need an introduction to the people that know you for sure. Yeah. You sell a ton of very high-end real estate in Mississauga. Yep. Uh, for people that usually listen to our podcast, my mom and my brother, uh, Mississauga is uh, where I grew up, like up oh, until nice. the age of four. Come yeah. on. Yeah. We're both. We're Applewood. Applewood. Okay. You know where yeah. Dixie Valley Mall of is? Of course I know. Across from Dixie Valley Mall, there's yeah. like a little plaza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a Baskin Robbins there I yeah, used to yeah. go to, I remember. And that's about it. That's crazy because, um, yeah, I actually grew up uh, a little bit close, close, close to that. Close enough. Oh, no yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I've been in Mississauga for, I guess, most of my life. Yeah. We used to live on, when we first came to Canada, we used to live on the West Mall. Well, actually, we went, we moved first. My, my parents moved to Brantford. That's where, like, the government wanted everyone to settle, right? The home <laughs> of Wayne Gretzky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? Well, okay. You could uh, do worse. No, no. It was Brad, Bradford. Bradford. Oh, Bradford. There's two different places. Okay. Right? But anyways, yeah. That's so, Toronto now. So, yeah. And then my parents were like, "This, we're not going to stay here, no. So then they like went to Etobicoke, West Mall, and we stayed there for a couple of years and then naturally gravitated to Mississauga. No way. And that's where I am now. Still still there. And now I'm in Etobicoke. <laughs> yeah. And Etobicoke is great. I love yeah. Etobicoke. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bradford uh, would have been good to buy a farm up there. Yeah. When your yeah. parents were there that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you buy anything. Uh, 30 plus years ago, you're doing really well. Yeah. Right. And that's actually the beautiful part about real estate. Like, um, so I went to university and I studied finance and, um, you know, specialized in or focused on uh, securities and futures and options and all that good mm-hmm. stuff. And I always th- I thought to myself, like the stock market, investing in the stock market, it was like, it's, it's obviously if you, the more information you have, the better you do. But, you know, the information, the good information, it's hard to find. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're kind of, you know, um, there's a lot of ups and downs in the stock market. Real estate always does well over the long run. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, um, that's something, you know, we saw the last, you know, say a few years were pretty volatile. But if we look at the run rate for the last 10 years, property values have doubled to tripled. That's not bad, especially if you take into consideration um, cash on cash returns and leveraging mortgage rates. And they were pretty low for many years up until now, right? So, yeah. So from that perspective, how I have like you seen? How, yeah, I, I, of course. How have you seen that? You just brought up mortgage rates. Yeah, I know. It's like, like <laughs> this is as soon as I, I was. Hear I, it, I looked like, over. Meh. I looked over at you to see how your I see your eyes like light yeah. up and you're like you know forty five watt. I I I you know. I saw your eyes light up like they're very watts. important <laughs> to me. They're very important to me. I hold yeah, them near and dear yeah. to my heart. 
Yeah. I always want to know how people see their markets being affected by them. Yeah. Like, yeah. Have, what have you noticed? Well, um, okay. So um, we had l- really low mortgage rates um, through COVID times. Um, and that you know, made money really cheap for people to borrow. And they spent it. They bought. Uh, and that really fueled housing prices. I remember when we first met, you were already doing mortgages. Yeah, yeah. Like you were like, oh yeah, like I, yeah. I do private mortgages. Yeah. I have some clients that have money. I have other clients that need money, and I put them yeah, together. Yeah, that's what I do. I like I match make right. Like I match make in real estate. I match make. I match make in all senses. I guess. Um, I'm kind of a solutions provider, and based on what I know well, right. And that's that's like numbers and real estate, and finance like finances. Um, and then I take it a next step further. Like if someone needs a renovation, like I'll, I'll, you know, provide solutions. Like, you know, they got questions about permits or, you know, planning processes. Like I, I like to help people kind of through the path or on the journey, their journey, make it happen for them. It's always hard referring people though. No, like, you know, like you refer somebody, like if it works out, it's great. But like you do a good job, your client's super happy with you. And then you refer somebody and it's a moving truck that drops half their shit on the ground. Yeah, I know. And that's like the, the biggest challenge, right? So I'm always pretty stern with my referrers or the people I'm referring. Um, so like, meaning like, they, and they would never let me down anyways, right? So I have a really good circle around What me. is the person you refer? The referee? The referrer? The refer- You're the referrer. The refer, yeah, the referee, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I always get confused with that. Same way we're like, uh, yeah, anyways. Um, so um, I'm lucky that through the years, my father, meeting a lot of people, those contacts got passed to me. And then through my years, I vetted those or met new contacts and have kind of like doubled, doubled up on it. Like it's just, I got really good people around me. How long have you been doing it for? 13 years. Wow. Yeah. 13 years. And um, so I did, uh, I was at Rogers for a bit after university doing project management, um, actually financial financial analysis and then project management for the IT department and the nine to five desk thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, it wasn't really, it wasn't, it was cool. It was, it was like, I went from finance, like, you know, finance degree to, uh, implementing, delivering IT projects, like, like the new iPhone that came out that has uh, you know, that's like a sales flow. So you gotta, if you know, there have a landing, like an iPhone landing page, and then there was like a sales flow where you can buy the phone or go on a wait list or whatever. You got to build that out for each new release. So, you know, I would do stuff like that. Hmm. And like, I, I had no idea. Like I, I never programmed in my life. I didn't know development. I had no idea, but I knew how to like kind of motivate and move teams or people that I'm really good at. Like that's, I know how to get people together and create synergies, motivate, and get them to their goals and, and, and alleviate obstacles. I love, like, that's the big thing I, I love doing. It's a pretty critical uh, it's huge, piece right? of the puzzle. People get stuck on things, right? And like, I just like to kind of plow through those things mm-hmm. and help people Wow. And um, that's, I guess, that match. So you're like a farmer, kind of. I'm a solutions provider. That's what I really am. Yeah. Yeah. A farmer. Yeah. <laughs> I am a farmer. I like that. Um, but yeah. So yeah, I did that. And then I, I uh, jumped into real estate because I, uh, it's funny. I was, you know, I was looking at, um, you know, I was, I was 23 years old. So I was kind of like career driven, dollar driven. Um, and I was kind of looking at my growth at the corporate side of things. And I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm a really hard worker. And I'm like thinking to myself, is a hundred percent of my hard work going to be recognized and rewarded? And, uh, I'm a rewards driven person. Right. So I like to see, you know, whatever hard work I put in, I kind of see the rewards. I I'm, I'm okay to wait for those rewards. I don't need to see them instantaneously. I'm patient, but I looked around and I thought to myself, well, you know, what's the youngest VP at Rogers. And they were like 32 years old. I was like 10 years from my age, right? What are they making? And I was like, you know what? I don't know if I can wait that long. <laughs> so then I looked at, I looked around and my father was doing really well in real estate, picked it up part-time and I uh, did it for six months part-time after work and, you know, um, on the weekends. And I made double my salary in the first six months. Wow. Part-time in real estate. And it's just been up from there. Yeah. And then from there, you know, it was, it was a nice journey because in the as we all are when we're younger, you know, um, the personality I am, and I think you too is, you know, we're all 
financially driven, you know, financial measures. Um, you're trying to be successful. Um, and then those change over time, right? You, you, as you're young, you, you think that's important. And then as time goes on, you start to realize there's more to life. There's more you know, balance. There's friends, family. More, more right? money? No, in terms of... Just kidding. Yeah, right? <laughs> measures change, right? Financial turns to, Financial measures turn to other types of measures and there's other values and, and things to chase in life, right? So that happened over the years. And I really, start to, I really started to see the, um, the fulfillment from, from, and this is going to sound kind of corny, but uh, from just my client satisfaction, right? That does sound corny. It does, right? right? Uh, but it, I truly, like, it's, I think actually that's what started because I, I made good money in real estate when I was younger, right? <laughs> I and then I, and I, was, I was buying all the stuff and all the materialistic stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling me anymore. It got to a point where I was just like. Is that suit Tom Ford? Mm, no, you know what? This is. That's uh, great. Thank you. This is a, you know what? This is a great, you know, I got to go back to this guy. Um, uh, so this is a dollar, do, dollar suit. I got to get more suits. Um, this guy makes a good suit. Dollar, yes. Looks great on you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I like your colors, by the way, Marcus. Thank like, you. I walked in here and, you know, you light up the room. Yeah. You do. Like, yeah. I like that. I like, I like the color combination. All right. So, um, yeah, the fulfillment. And that changed. And uh, that's really the most, that's the infinitive. Or infinitive Definitive. No, in, sorry. In, infinite amount of fulfillment oh. comes from. Um, you know, uh, client satisfaction it really does because that, that, uh, you can't get enough of that. You met like, you know, the, the, just people looking at you and saying like, you know, good job, right? Like we're really happy with what you've done for us. And like that really, that goes a long way mm -hmm. for me at least and a lot longer than, you know, just when I was in my early twenties selling real estate and making a commission check, right? That, that only went so far. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, I'm not sure where we're, I forget where we're going with this, but um, yeah, that was uh, your was, movement into the industry. Yeah, so you yeah, yeah. In the industry, you kind of start seeing this evolution. Yeah, I know what you mean. Listen, like I started at Scotia Capital, oh, like okay. out of university, did finance, went to Scotia Capital, was an associate to an analyst in auto parts. Oh wow! Just to describe it for you, right? Like it's about boring as it gets. And so you're working on an Excel spreadsheet. You're looking at 10 Q like the quarterly reports from different companies like Magna and Premdor and Linamar and like all yeah. of yeah. And you're trying to, to use the data to make a recommendation on the companies. But you're really just kind of showing it to your boss. Horrible. And, and like Marcus, like for me. Yeah. Well, well, you learned a lot, I'm sure. Did I? I think so. Because you sure? Like, well, I think you you were looking for the arbitrage, I guess, in those scenarios, right? Like you're looking for the, for the, oh, I didn't have any money to take advantage. I know. Well, <laughs> that's, that's the other thing too, right? You start working for yourself and you start, uh, start making some more money, but, um, yeah, I but I think, do it. but I couldn't, couldn't do, do it. it much, much similar to you. I just reached this point where I was thinking to myself, like I was working, you know, like I was going downtown. I remember driving downtown, my mom and dad, I was living at my parents' place. We drive downtown in the morning. And I would pass homeless people sleeping in sleeping bags on subway grates with like, it looked like they had a really good setup, right? Like sleeping bags, all their stuff near them. The subway grate had the steam coming out of them. I was like, the the back. like, I was like a little bit hungover maybe, or I hadn't slept well the night before. I was probably gone out with buddies. It was six o'clock in the morning. My poor parents were waking up earlier to go to work so that they could drive me in. Right. And I was going to Scotia Tower to the 68th floor and everything should have been amazing. But I was, as I was driving there, sleeping in the car ride from my parents' place in Etobicoke downtown, it was coming off the gardener, driving by a homeless person on York Street and being like, man, what I would give to still be sleeping right now. Right. <laughs> And that's interesting. How did you feel walking into the building, the Scotiabank building? Like, well, maybe the first dozen times I felt like I was just big shot. This, right. But then I, the, like the 14th time, the 13th, 14th, like you just realize that the, you're like a tiny little clog in the wheel yeah. and you are totally meaningless, totally dispensable. And the bank will use you and spit you out as it sees fit, just like any of the raw materials it uses to make a profit. And that moment is a learning moment. Shout too, out right? Scotia Bay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like that experience right there, 
opens your eyes, right? It really makes you start thinking, well, what else can I do? How else can I grow this? Well, you, you know? said it. You were working at Rogers. Yeah. And then you started working with your dad selling real estate and you were making more money. Yeah. Well, I was working at Scotia Capital. I was making $80,000 a year. It was like the most coveted That's job hot. coming was, out of that university. Was, how, that was like how long? 2001, 2002. Okay. So we're... Oh, okay. All right. All right. 21 that's, years that's a, ago. That's big money. Yeah. That is big money. Yeah. And then I decided in my infinite wisdom, yeah. which did not seem very wise at the time, just as you say, I was putting all this effort in. What was my risk return? What was, how much of my life did I have to give in order to get to the point where I saw success? Right. I looked at the people around me. I was like, listen, there's a lot of people that make a lot of money in the banks, especially on the 68th floor of Scotia Tower. I just didn't think I was going to be capable of sitting, sitting there for 10 years to get to that level. And uh, I went and started doing mortgages. And it for the first couple of months, it was horrible. Like I was driving my mom's car. Steep learning curve, right? Yeah. Driving my mom's car. I would print off pieces of paper every day, hand out flyers to real estate agents. I'd get like literally kicked out of rental buildings by people who were like, clearly had like their rent subsidized by the government and I was just so, doing my best to like so you were you were prospecting rentals yeah man to get them on mortgages I was brilliant we had at the time you got to remember this is the year 2002 there was a 95% loan to value purchase program with a 7% cash back it was all it was equity equity based right they would yeah. give you 2% of the property you were buying yeah. upon closing that's crazy yeah now it's what, 80, 80, 85 at best? On a purchase? Yeah, it purchase, really depends. Right? But yeah, like CMHC won't insure anything over a million bucks, right? You know yeah, that? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Anyways, it was like, it took a couple months. I was really persistent because like I was living at my parents' place. I was driving my mom's car. I was meeting up with my buddies from university. Everybody was looking at me like I had a hole in my head. Like, you what left you Scotia? You're yeah. like, what do you got? Finance guru to mortgage yeah. guy. Right? Were you like got a drug problem or something? <laughs> and, um, and then like, honestly, it was like the third or the fourth month. I saved up all the money that I had made. I bought a building. And I wrote Mortgage Marcus on the front of the building. Yeah, and that was my new company, again, Mortgage how, Marcus. How old? How old again? Uh, 20... Two years old. 22, 22 years old. You, you leave this cushy financial, you know, you got all the, no, it's, it's Scotia bag. I, I would call it soul sucking, but you say cushy. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's the fancy, it's the fancy job, right? You're working downtown, you're coming from Mississauga or Tobacco, and then you got this fancy job in Bay street basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then you leave it all. And then you take, you like dive head first into like this big ocean. And uh, you buy a building at 22 years old. I mean, it was a storefront and apartment. It doesn't matter. On Dundas at Run and Me. There's a lot of 22 year olds, that are, you know, the, there's not a lot of 22 year olds buying homes at this point, right? $280,000. I put $14,000 down, 5% down. Oh, yeah. TD had a program at the time, a commercial residential mortgage mix. So basically, if the building was less than. 20% commercial, you could finance it with a residential mortgage and utilize CMHC. Right. It was amazing. And, and how's that changed, Marcus? Like, so um, now, like from back then and, and now in terms of lending and, and, and uh, the rules, how's that changed? How much has that changed? And how hard, how much harder is it now for leaps and bounds? Right? Yeah. And this is what I'm thinking. Like, we were talking about interest rates before. I think we got mm -hmm. off topic there a bit. Um, we got interested. You know, we're talking about the fun stuff, our mm -hmm. lives. Um, but um, that's the one thing. I think there was, um, so I was looking at, there was this, someone did a video um, on an analysis about the average, uh, average income compared to um, the average mortgage payment. And uh, looking at, a, so basically affordability back in the 60s and 70s compared to now. Because a lot of people say that interest rates were higher back then. And, you know, everyone was complaining about the higher interest rates, you know. And even back in the 90s, mm -hmm. it was uh, 15, 16, 17%. And then we all say back, well, the house, the, the house prices were lower. So 
the best measure or the best way to benchmark it is, okay, well, how much money were people making in, say, the mid-90s at these higher interest rates? What, were their, what, was, what was their cost, their monthly cost, and compared to what our incomes are now and what the mortgage rates are? And what they figured was that it actually is more expensive to own now than it was in the 90s, even at the higher interest rates, you know, which is crazy, right? And that worries me because the affordability, like we have an issue with affordability, not so much within the, someone that's selling and buying, um, you're already, anyone that's already in the market, that's not, it's not, affordability isn't such an issue for them uh, because we're just dealing with net numbers, right? Um, the affordability is an issue for anyone coming into the market, mm -hmm. into the purchase, into the real estate market. I can imagine like, you know, average sale price in South Mississauga right now is 1.8 million. Is it really? 1.8 million. So I'll, I'm going to run you through some numbers. Sure. So, and talk a little bit about the market. So December, average sale price for a freehold house um, in South Mississauga is 1.8 million. Detached, semi-detached, or this doesn't is freehold, matter? Freehold, freehold category. So okay. it would be your detached, semis, okay. and freehold towns. Um, so 1.8 million in December. And as we know, interest rate, it was a lot of uncertainty uh, uncertainty um, stalls purchases, right? So the more uncertainty, the more people are going to wait, especially as interest rates go up, prices come down as well. That's the other thing. So we saw interest rates going up. You know this better than I do. Um, and then in January, and we were all, so I was telling everyone, I said, look, wait for the bottom of the market. And then everyone would say, well, Peter, that's okay. That's great, great, great advice. But how do we know when the bottom of the market is? I said to everyone, look, the bottom of the market is going to be once interest rates level out, the increases. Like once we, once we have, you know, they're increasing, as interest rates are increasing, prices are going to come down. So we're, you know, it's kind of like a U shape. Mm -hmm. The bottom of that U is going to be the bottom of the market. And that is going to be, um, how we're going to know is, and you want to be before that U, not coming out of the U. And we're like out of the U now, we're on the other side. But it's when the Bank Canada uh, and, in, and we have to look, we have to also keep an eye. I was keeping an eye on inflation, um, on CPI numbers as well. But basically looking at, once they announced that interest rates would pause, when they would pause on the increases, that would, that would have uh, signaled to the market that that's the bottom, mm -hmm. right? And that's what happened in January. So in January 25th, I don't know if everyone remembers that, but um, that was the bottom of the market. So uh, average price was $1.5 in January. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. So it went from 1.8 in December. To We're 20% higher than that right now. We are. Wow. You know that. Okay. Well, you said 1.8. Oh, well, the... Okay. So we were 1.8 in December. January, we were 1.55. February, 1.7. And to, uh, for the month of March, we're back to 1.8. So we went up by, give or take, 17, 18% wow. from the bottom of the market in January. So we, it, prices have increased from January, the bottom of the market. This was the worst month for many, many years. That's encouraging. Um, we're up 20%. Well, What's say, the, say, what are the volume numbers like on that? So that's the thing, right? So if we look at year-over-year -year volume numbers, we're down uh, from last like year. Like how much? Because, the, okay, so by 100, by half, by half. Okay. Um, so um, it, February last year was the peak of the market. Um, just to give you an idea, we had about 100, for the month of March, we had about 60 we had about 67 sales, okay? And that's South Mississauga, South Mississauga right? Yeah, okay. 67 sales. What is the border of that? Yeah, so that's uh, anything south of Queensway, let's just say. Okay. Queensway. Queensway, so north, just north of the highway, south of Queensway. Everything south of the Queensway. And east-west? And oh, uh, east, east Mississauga to west Mississauga, so Oakville to Tobacco. The whole, the whole, the whole, anything basically south of Queensway. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying border. to picture it geographically. Yeah, so yeah, basically okay. Aaron Mills, or sorry, Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill all on the, the way west, to, yeah. yeah, on the west and just a little bit past Winston Churchill. Uh, and then east to Dixie and just a little bit east of Dixie. Okay. Okay. Along the highway. The yeah. dim sum joint, Queensway at Dixie. Have you been there? Jade mm -hmm. dim sum? No, I haven't. Actually, I know. I drive. Yeah, it's right at Queensway, Queensway and Dixie. Uh, Queens it's a good spot. Yeah, I know. I know. A lot of Chinese people in there. Okay. That's, that's a good sign. That's how you can tell. <laughs> That's not being sign. racist, just <laughs> being realistic. Um, so the, uh, we had, for year over year, we had 111 units sell last March. So that gives you, it's about half, right? So we had 67 this past month, 111 units sell last March. So we're 50% uh, less on, on uh, volume. But here's the kicker. Homes are selling for the month of March 40% faster than they were in February. And we have 46% more transactions for the month of March over the month of February. So no, that's good. Homes are selling quicker. 
homes are selling, there's more homes selling and homes are selling for on average right now, $33,000 more a week for the last 60, 60 days. So if we do the math from January to now, homes are increasing by 33K a week in South Mississauga for freehold. Wow. So they're selling quicker, um, more of it, and for more money. That's the market we're in right now. And that's all because there's more certainty given by the Bank of Canada. Inflation rates are coming down. Bank of Canada say, okay, you know, we're going to pause. And this is kind of where I lean to you, Marcus. What do you think is going to happen going forward? Because it's all about inflation, right? With I'm still rates. scared. <laughs> You're still scared? Yeah. Uh, I don't like to hear that. <laughs> well, we were, so we were talking a little bit about it um, before. And the, so Bank of Canada ha- issued their monetary policy report today. Yes, they did. And th- they mentioned the impact that interest rates will have on household debt and the lagging effect of it. So my, my only concern is like, listen, I said going into this spring market, if we had a four handle on the five-year fixed rate, we were going to see a resilient spring market. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that like the, 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 the sooner we can get to normalized fixed rates, it's almost like a psychological barometer for the market, right? Exactly. Like 4.49 five-year fixed rate, the market will look at that and be like, okay. That's okay. Prime rate's that. crazy. Yeah. I don't want a variable rate. We want, I, I think you want to see more people look at that five-year fixed rate and jump into it instead of what we're seeing right now, where there's more people just taking one and two-year fixed rates, like hoping to kind of wait out this period of time where short-term rates are and you're seeing a lot of that, right? Because I'm hearing a lot about that. But the Bank thinking- of Canada issued it in their report. Never mind. Okay. It's something that people are kind of very keenly looking at as a leading indicator for how we climb back out of this. Because we're so used to, like we all over the last, say, 20 years, we've seen variable be the right choice, right? And I remember 20 years ago when I bought my first place, um, I bought fixed. I, I, I bought with fixed mortgage and because I, and I needed that certain, that, that consistency. That consistency. And I, you know, that was the first and last time I bought fixed, Mm -hmm. right? So uh, from then on, it was variable all the way. And we've always made money better than the fixed, right? Mm -hmm. It was always net positive. Now we're starting to see kind of that full circle, people coming back to fix. And I'm seeing a lot of that one, two year. And you're saying that, you know, people are talking about that. Well, just, it's cheaper than a variable. And what do you think is the, what would you recommend at this, in this, like, Based on what you know and where we're at, and you have the bigger picture, what would you recommend? I think interest rates are going to be higher for longer than the bond market is anticipating right now. Yes. So I think like the Bank of Canada all but said today that rates will stay where they are until the end of the year. So, so rates will change in 2024, not in 2023. Down. Down, yeah. Yes. For sure. Down. Yes. Yes. Um, but I think that the banks are risk modeling for rates to come down prior to that, right? Right. I think the market is telling us rates are going to come down sooner than what the central banks are telling us. Why do you think that is, Marcus? I think that, okay, on a fundamental level, I think that um, the markets are always overly optimistic. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that they believe that the central banks will pivot sooner in the face of a recession. So they'll see some, some, something fundamental change in the market that gives them pause and says, geez, this is a problem. Like, for example, when Silicon Valley Bank, when, when the run happened on Silicon Valley Bank, and we spoke about it on the show, but basically they had invested a lot of their capital into long-term notes with low interest rates. Right. And they had a, not a run, well, essentially they ended up having a run on the bank, but the depositors needed their capital back. As a result, Silicon Valley Bank needed to sell these longer term instruments and take a loss on them in order Discount. to repay. Yeah. Yeah. And the difference between what they sold them for and what they had deposits for was greater than the market capitalization of the bank. Of, yeah, the value. Right. Yeah. So that brought up a fundamental problem with how the banks were operating in the United States. As a result, the treasury had to step in and create a solution 
and look to other banks that were in similar situations and behind the scenes, create more solutions. So I don't think that's fully done yet. But as a result, we saw bond yields drop almost one percentage point. Uh, I heard. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. At that moment, the central bankers didn't say anything, right? Jerome Powell didn't come out and say anything. Tip Macklem didn't say anything. They mention it in this monetary policy report. They allude to more serious fundamental problems that could be underlying in the economy. The IMF came out and said something about it in there. They're doing like a conference in Washington where I'm sure everybody's fully utilizing their IMF expense accounts. But what it shows you is that the market anticipates these events having an impact on the Federal Reserve or read the central banks of the G7 nations. Mm -hmm. But the central banks didn't pivot. The central banks, the Bank of Canada came out today and said, we're not moving rates. So for rates to move faster, lower, faster, something's going to have to break. And the, the problem is right now, employment is so utilized, yes, it is. right? Like our level of employment, labor utilization is so high that the cost of labor will continue to creep in to the things we buy, mm-hmm. the services we utilize, and that makes inflation, inflation. stick here. Yeah. And that's what's scary for a central bank. Yeah. Like how do you, you know, infl- a lot of inflation was, um, was uh, energy, gas, right? Um, now mortgages, mortgage, a lot of mortgages are, are factored. Energy is a good one because the Saudis don't care anymore. I know. What did they just do recently? Like they, they are now... What are 5% they? output cut. Right. And initiated by Saudi Arabia on a non-meeting of OPEC. So basically that's like the Bank of Canada coming out when a, on a not scheduled for a meeting and saying, we're making a change, right? We're ratcheting up interest rates. In fact, it has the, the opposite effect, right? Because increasing the price of oil essentially affects inflation, right? Uh, it will it increase. It. Yeah, it's 100%. Yeah. And how do you drive to work with less gas, right? And how do you eat slower? less food, right? Slow, do you have to go slower? Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? But like a that, Tesla. This is the thing that boggled my mind. Like, Let's increase. Okay, so you know, people are starting to think. You know, more housing prices. You know, they're combating housing prices with increasing interest rates. No, no, no. Interest rates are are increasing because of inflation, right? I keep reminding some people about that. Um, but how do you combat eating less food and driving less to reduce consumption of of energy and or heat your house less? How do you do that? Um, and you can't. Like you're so what you you know. I think there's something bigger there that needs to be looked at. And we have some, some issues, right, with the war and logistics and all of that. And, and to your point, some of the financial systems too, right? Listen, the federal government does not want real estate prices to fall. No, because it's right? security for everyone. Yeah, they right? do not want prices to fall. However, the thing they're more scared about is untamed inflation. Yes, yes. That causes a more serious threat to an economy. It damages it more and it's harder to if it, the longer inflation stays around for the harder it is for it to well, be removed they say inflation is the killer of capitalism right. that's what they say right so we'll see we'll see what i mean the other killer of capitalism is constantly tinkering with financial institutions and deciding on how much free money you should give people and when you should take it away telling people how long interest rates are going to stay low for then increasing them like the more tinkering that happens the more we're doing our job to break capitalism right, right? like Silicon Valley Bank was a for-profit financial institution that put itself out there for its shareholders to maximize profit, right? Yeah. But failed because they were too greedy. As a result, the investments that they made could not be sold to cover the deposits that they were approved to take. So their company was worth negative money, but... The treasury stepped in yes. and rescued them. That's not capitalism either. No, you should, yeah, the bailouts, I mean, to a degree, right? Bailouts are good, but yeah, there's always... And even now, like even the federal government and the Bank of Canada are at odds. Like the Bank of Canada issues their monetary policy report and they're like, listen, you know, um, one of the things we weren't really expecting is how much spending happened in the budget. Yeah. Right? Like well, that's inflationary. Again. Yeah, of course. Um, 
yeah, you know, the fiscal policy doesn't doesn't really line up. I do think we're... I'll tell you. I do think macro level, uh, what you're what you're saying about the South Mississauga market mm-hmm. is being echoed by every single real estate agent I speak to. I, I think so, because that's what I see, I'm hearing. And, and like, we're not special in the sense that we're not any different. There's nothing special about Southern Mississauga that makes it a different market. It's not in Oakville. Oakville is, you know, kind of special too. But, but yeah, to your point, I mean, I think it's... So I grew up in basically, I was born in South Mississauga. Yeah, you are South Mississauga, you know, yeah, uh, ex-resident. Yeah. I might have to sell you a house Applewood. in South Mississauga. I might sell you back on moving back. Applewood. Just so we can spend more time together. Yeah. <laughs> this has been great. You got yeah. a lot of info. I like so it. I wonder... I wonder if do you see, but based on kind of the borrowers and the borrowers, the purchasers that you have that you're working with and the sellers that you see in the market, are you seeing, is your phone ringing right now by more people that are saying, hey, Peter, like, I don't know what's going on with my mortgage. The rate's getting a little high. I'm debating whether to list it. Or are you seeing more people call you say, Peter, I got to get into this market. It's heating up. This is a great question. The market I deal with. Um, they don't talk much about mortgages or the interest rates or the costs because I think the disposable income is pretty big. Um, and the, like, I, it's not, they're not, it's not as sensitive to them, I, I believe. Right. Um, so, and I feel like their the purchases are typically conservative compared to what they can, like the, some of the people I work with, they're celebrities, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, entrepreneurs, owners of big companies. And they're like, they're not living, like they're living in, like I, I have the record sale prices in Mississauga basically all over, right? Really? So yeah, I have the highest sale price in Mississauga. What is the highest sale price? $12 million. Wow. On the water. Um, Who bought that? Kim Kardashian? Uh, no, but like- Burt Reynolds? A banker. A banker. Oh. Yeah, right? <laughs> but I did sell a house. Uh, actually, I probably shouldn't shouldn't share all this. But yeah, John John Tavares I, and a couple other hockey players. But I won't, I won't talk more about where, where they bought. But um, but some of these, you know, so th- they're buying properties that, uh, and I'm just talking in general now, um, that aren't like overly crazy expensive, right? And so I don't think the, mor- the mortgages that they're taking on are huge mortgage where it's going to bury them, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not like a huge impact to them. But where I am, finding the conversation around uh it's the lower price points you know the more the more middle like the more palatable price points so i would say anything luxury is basically you know from a from a from a numbers perspective it's really hard to 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 categorize luxury in a numbers perspective it's more about the use uh, the, the the sorry the space and how and the and the finishes um because you can have you can have a a, a, a luxury home out in Kilbride or Burlington or, or Campbellville, wherever, and it's a million and a half dollars and it's a luxury house, or you can have a million and a half dollar home in South Mississauga and that's going to get you a condo, right? So it's not really a number. It's more about the space, the size, the finishes, and in, in my opinion, the practicality of it. So anything really over 2,800 square feet, 3,000 square feet, you're, you're starting to really get into a luxury space. Mm-hmm. Um, you can achieve your typical two-story, four-bedroom home for family, within three up to three thousand square feet right um so it's it's those price points where the people are starting to talk about and they're worrying about the mortgages and they're starting to call me and this is the thing like i haven't had the calls yet where people are calling because they are scared i haven't had those great so that's that's so and this is a great question you ask i gauge the market and how the market's doing based on how many phone calls i get a day and just phone calls and text messages. So when we were in COVID, like being in COVID, like it was, it was, there's up, these ups and downs, but then there was this, these moments where I would get like, I would, I would pick up a phone, pick up a call. And then on that call, I get three more missed calls. And I did that for like months and I just couldn't keep up with my, with pe- re- returning people's like, and there were, it was calls about, Hey, what do you think the more the market's going to go? Like there's a lot of uncertainty, but the market was doing well because there was very little supply. And there was a lot of demand because people wanted more space, office space at home and backyard space because we weren't traveling. Mm-hmm. So there's needed this, like a chat GPT AI. I needed that. To, I know. I needed like a clone of me, right? And um, and then, you know, as the market slowed down, less calls. So I'm getting more calls now than I did in the last, say, eight to 10 months, 12 months, or since last year or spring. Right. Um, and that tells me that the market's picking up. We're having, we have an issue right now with, supply mm-hmm. big issue that's sustaining prices right 
Um, we don't have enough inventory. Um, and that, you know, the spring market will bring more inventory. But I think there's a lot of people just holding back on listing their homes because, I mean, mo- there's more comfort now. But say a couple months ago, most sellers were, were saying that, no, we're not going to list. It's not a good market. Now the market's improving. They might change their mind. There might be more supply coming to market. Um, I'm hoping, and and there is pent up demand from last year. There's a lot of buyers from the fall market that didn't make purchases because of the uncertainty. And they said, look, interest rates are going up. Why would we buy now? A month or two from now, interest rates are going to go up again. Prices are going to keep, keep going down. We're going to wait. They waited and now they're in the spring market and they're competing with the spring market buyers. So we got double demand, pent up demand, double demand. Half and, supply. And half supply which is really elevating those prices. That's the answer to why we have an increase in average price. Um, I'm still waiting for this, these phone calls to come in to say, you know, mortgage rates are too high. We can't afford the, and, and it's, well, I'm not getting those calls. And I don't think I'm in the market that that's going right. to happen. Yeah. But I am hearing through other agents in those lower price points that things are getting tight. Things are getting tight, right? And there is a bit, there, sorry, tight as in the market is tight or tight as in people are calling them to sell? tight as in uh, expenses, right? And um, there, there is a, there's about a four to six, just like the, just like, mon- just like monetary policy, there's about a four to six month lag between monetary policy and the market. There is about a four month, la- four month, four months lag between the lower price points and the higher price points. So whatever happens in the, oh, really? there is, there is. So when the, the, when the market gets legs in the lower price point, we don't see that in the high price point until what, a few months later. Because you have to think, the $4 million buyer, um, and like I do, my average price point is like three and a half million. And I do, like it's like, it's like basically three plus is what I do. Um, so that $4 million buyer will not buy a $4 million home. If, okay, so if they have, let's just say they're, they're, they're moving from North, North Mississauga, and they're getting, you know, they're expecting to get two million on their sale of their house, but they only get one five. Well, they're not buying the, the four million dollar home anymore. They're buying the three and a half, right? So, and the uncertainty of that of what they're going to get for their home, they're just going to pause their their purchase altogether or negotiate a really try to negotiate a really low price on that four million dollar home. And if the deal is not going to go together because the sellers, they don't most they're of not the, sellers, the same pressure. Yeah. Well, they don't that because they don't need to really sell because they're not as mortgage sensitive, uh, mortgage rate sensitive. So then we got less transactions, right? Um, but back to um, now that there's more certain in the market, those two, those two million dollar homes are getting two million dollar homes. So that buyer feels that that excitement that yeah, I just you know I was you know I was getting offers for a million and a half a few months ago. I held off, luckily, and now I'm getting my two million that I'm looking for. And they sell that two million, and now they're happy. They got money in their hand, and now they're going to go and look at that four million and pay four million for that house. And now the market's fluid and it's moving. So that's what's happening. One year from now, what are real estate prices in South Mississauga? The average went from one eight down to one five, back at one eight. Twelve months from today, we meet again. Are you to hold me to this. We might have, you know what, we're going to have to do this again in a year from now. Yeah. And then we're going to play back the tape and see what happens. Um, so, hmm, you know, it's kind of why, like, I'm talking with you right now just to kind of get the future folk, future, uh, future uh, view from you. But from my perspective, mm-hmm. um, South Mississauga is... Hey, I'll, I'll paint a little bit of the picture sure, from where it. I think rates will be. I think yeah, rates will that, be because that's 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 key. I think you right. will probably have a five-year fixed rate with a three handle. So five-year fixed rates will be three point, a bit th- like not less than three and a half, maybe three point eight, three point nine percent on a five-year fixed rate. Okay, so that that paints a really good picture for me. Okay, so I'll tell you this: the best five-year fixed rate. Okay, though, okay? so like, I'll tell the you, banks this. will be like quoting six and a half still. I'll tell you this. South Mississauga is a unique market where everyone wants to get in, regardless of what market we're in. There's always people wanting better schools, better better neighborhoods, better location, better homes, um, just you know more more prestigious. Everyone wants that, and we have a very educated class. We have people making money, entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers. They're making the same amount, if not more. So there's always demand. There's not a lot of supply. And as we know, homes sell based on law, supply, and demand. So from that perspective, South Mississauga always does pretty well. They don't even have big, um, 
pick, uh, deep. We don't have big uh, peaks and valleys. Mm-hmm. But as soon as the interest rates come down, it's going to blow up. And uh, it blow up in a good way. Uh, prices are going to go through the roof again, just like they did. Um, because it's going to bring that co- back that confidence. If you're telling me that interest rates, fixed interest rates are going to be around three and a half, is that what you're saying? I, no, no. I'm saying there's no way they're three and a half. I'm saying a three handle, like 3.95, oh, okay. 3.89, right. like so, something like that. And that's... And, 60 basis points off of where they are. We've been, basis okay, so I'll answer it this way. We've on a five-year s- fixed. We've been seeing a 10%, on average, 10% increase in price in South Mississauga for the last decade. We saw, we saw about uh, 30, 20, 30, 40% increases in, in through COVID. Uh, 10% uh, a year on average, let's just say, last decade. I would say that we're going to be over 2 million. I think we're going to be over 2 million. If interest rates come down, we're going to be over 2 million. And I'll, 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 I'll say that. All right. I'll say that confidently. And then hopefully average <laughs> freehold. We'll be so over 2 million. Uh, over two we'll be over 2 million. April, 2024. If interest rates come down. All right. I'll say that. I don't, I can't foresee the only way the average price is going to come down in South Mississauga is if supply kicks up. Right. That's the only way. Um, because demand's constant and it always outstrips supply. So if that's the case, then prices will never come down. It's funny, right? Like that's the story of the entire real estate market, right? We can't keep up with demand, right? We, we just allowed a million new immigrants to come into the country. We're not doing anything about supply. It's a constant, constant problem. How do you, how do you fix supply? Or, okay, so you know what? Like here's a, it's kind of a, it could be almost a, bit of a political um, question or approach, but um, what's the right way of fixing this issue? Uh, is it demand or is it curbing demand or is it increasing supply? What do you think and how do we do it? I have some thoughts on that. What do you think? Uh, okay, so right away, I would tell you that there are constraints on the development market that are not only artificial, but frankly, not even wanted by the municipalities or the provinces. Like there are inefficiencies at almost every level level of government that put time and cost restrictions on developers to bringing units to market. Like you're sitting in a building right now that everybody agrees should be a six-story condominium building. Or more. Right. That's or, I, I'd say more. more. Should be should more. right. It should be a <laughs> thank you very much. Right. It should be at least a 15 story building. There we go. And that's the solution. Based on its location. Yes. Right. So the problem is, is that the way that developers have to get projects approved is so antiquated. It involves so much red tape. The time that it takes is the most expensive piece of this. Mm-hmm. Right. Developers buy a piece of property in the hopes of rezoning it, increasing density, because they they see the natural supply demand dynamics at play in the economy. Yes. But they have these governors placed upon them. It's like you ever go go-karting when you were a kid and you know that the go-kart is supposed to go like a hundred kilometers an hour, but they have those stupid governors on it that only lets it go 40 kilometers an hour. Yeah. The governor is actually people that aren't good at their jobs. They work in rezoning. They work in different different roles, and they stymie development and growth. And it's natural. And it's like there's a bit of not in my backyard from people that live in the area where development's happening. There's counselors that you know oppose things just for the sake of opposing things. All of this stymies growth. And if you keep stymieing growth, you add on costs that are borne by developers, and you reduce development. Hundred percent, and maybe we need to get more private sector into the public sector. Uh, public sector, um, you know, you hit a you hit a really liberal big, government, by the way. Oh, increased <laughs> government, federal government employees by thirty percent. Just to let you know. All right. So All right. we actually, you think we needed? Like you're obviously wrong, because the liberal government must be right. They're the people. Oh that yeah, are in yeah, charge. Yeah, yeah. So just so that you know, the federal government decided they needed. 30% more employees to accomplish these things. So maybe that'll speed things up. Yeah. Well, 
um, I would say that the um, you you actually said something really important. Um, we don't have we we have we have we have <laughs> demand is there's nothing wrong with demand. It's the supply that's the issue, like we said earlier. Transit, improve transit to the outside of the GTA, right? Let's get some let's get some movement, right? Let's let's make it easier to get out of the city, develop, and open up some of the space, right? And develop the space outside of the city. Or if we don't want to do that, then let's densify the space and, and eliminate the bureaucracy that we are talking about um, in municipalities and, and for developers and, and just make it easier for people to build, right? And create more space. And this whole Build 23 is exactly that. And I'm seeing a lot of the developers and builders in my area take advantage of that. We used to have site plan and you'd have to wait 12 months to get an approval to build. And now it's six months. So it's, uh, it's just a building. Listen, plan. I think the provincial government is doing more than any provincial, municipal, or federal government has so far to increase density here. Yes. And this is going to combat affordability. And we talked about affordability earlier. It's not, it's, you know, reducing the house, the reducing real estate prices is not, like, you can't do that. That's, that's again, um, meddling with free, uh, free market economics. But, which is to your point, the, 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 the governor on the go-kart, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what we need to do is we need to increase density. And what's, what this is what this bill is all about. Imagine that now you have two income uh, streams from your current residential property. So the person that was hoping to live by the lake, this is what I'm seeing. A lot of people that come down on the weekends to enjoy Lake Ontario and Port Credit um, and you know, they'll spend time down there, walk around, and, and they'll make picnics and st- stuff like that and enjoy the space. But they cannot live down there because it's just too expensive. Like I said, $1.8 million for an average uh, freehold uh, house or um, uh, housing price around one point eight million in South Mississauga, North Mississauga, it's like one point two, one point three, something like that, right? So there's a significant difference. But that five hundred thousand dollar difference in mortgage, if you could get three thousand dollars a month in rent, that will that will compensate your five hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Because every hundred thousand dollars right now is about six hundred bucks a month, yeah, give or take. Yeah. So if you can get three thousand dollars a month in rent from the basement apartment and from your detached you know, coach house in the back, which they're allowing you to build now. Even if there's no laneway in the back? You can, you, so you can have three, three um, units, three, three units on a property. That's what uh, they allow you. But, so even if there's no laneway in the back, you can put a coach house? I mean, there's, there's going to be zoning bylaws, right? So that's, that, this is all going to be contested, right? So the idea is, um, you know, do you build that? Like I have, I have like a cabana that's almost livable in my backyard. Mm-hmm. It's called, I have like a pool house kind of thing and it's heated and it's got, a, you know, a little kitchenette. Um, Be careful. I, I, know, Matt, I know. Matt, the producer of the show might move in there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, and uh, you yeah, like we'll, it we'll, now. We'll, we'll, we'll like it because I'll have someone to drink with, you know. You like it now. Night. You like it now. <laughs> but when your wife goes out for a cup of coffee in the morning and he'll still and be there, sees some naked guy with a beard <laughs> suntanning next to your swimming pool. Uh, I like it. <laughs> that uh, happened once, Marcus. Uh, that happened once. Uh, oh, so this is, oh, okay. this is a real thing. Um, all right. So, <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that this is going to allow people to enjoy space that they couldn't enjoy before. Um, and that's amazing. You know, and that's what this, that's the beautiful part about this bill 23. Now the people that are living in poor credit, they're not too happy about that. Right. The people that are anti kind of, you know, development and all that, because it does change the space. Like I, I can only imagine, you know, all, you know, additional cars on the, in, being parked in the driveway or, you know, just, just more dent, you know, more people. It's, but that's the reality of, Growth. It's a reality of evolution, of a reality of our hey, poor credit. 15 years ago, you didn't want to walk through poor credit 15, 20 years ago. It was not a pretty place. It was rough. Really? It was rough. And people forget that. It was a rough place. I, I'll um, jump in there. I used to work at the Waterside Inn, and that was like the hotel that pretty much genderfied everything. It was used to be a, uh, like a crack building that everybody would say. And, and from that hotel, the whole waterfront changed. Yes. And, and, and yes, yes. And it's cleaned up a lot. Um, there's some, there's a couple of developers in there. Fram did a big development, um, on St. Lawrence there, cleaned up the, you know, cleaned up the area. 
restaurants moved in. Now there's Brightwater. There's going to be Lakeview Inspiration. So there's a lot. There's like Brightwater is the huge one, right? Huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Three thousand. Trid- Tridel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kilmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so seventy-five acres of land, um, and uh, just under three thousand units going in there. And then Lakeview Inspiration Double, which is east of Cothra. Great investment opportunity. Anything along Lakeshore, Cothra area, I'm looking to buy in there. That's the fastest growing pocket of Mississauga right now is Lakeview. East of Cothra, in, uh, north and south of Lakeshore, we're seeing some serious growth there. Oh, wow. Uh, so, and severances. That's where the money's made. Buy 50 foot, um, sever into 25s, you know, develop it. And that's, that's your, your, you're riding the coattails of Lakeview Inspiration, which is, it's a master waterfront community. Uh, gyms, restaurants, uh, beautiful parks, like lots of trails. Uh, it's a lifestyle thing. Brightwater, same thing, right? It's all, you know, you're going to farm boy, LCBOs, cl- clinics, uh, medical clinics, you know, one stop. You're basically going to be able to just not drive, you don't have to drive your car, which is the idea, right? And just walk around and everything's accessible. There's going to be many poor credits in poor credit. Wow. Yeah. So it's really cool. So this is like a huge change for poor credit. And you just got to embrace it. That's where it's, that's where we're going. And, uh, that's going to increase real estate prices. Land is king. You know, I would, I, I strongly recommend buying land in and around poor credit all along Lakeshore. Land, you, you can't, you can't, you can't create land. You can create condos and, and structures, but, and soil never gets. Unless, unless you're an Emirati. Right. Then in you, which case you can create land. You can like, you, yeah. Or Dubai, right. They yeah. need that big island. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's like turning real estate upside down, right? right? The whole concept of it. Um, so that's, what's helpful for the Russians, right? They want to put their money somewhere. Yeah. 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 Right. The, the oligarchs. Um, so, you know, soil never gets old structures that do, they depreciate by land. That's, that's my suggestion for sure. I, you can't go wrong if, you know, and, and the density is going to keep putting pressure on the value of that land. Right. Right. So this is like, if someone's asking me, Hey, what do you, what would you recommend? Like you asked me, you know, what do you, where do you think prices are going to go next year? They're going to go up um, just simply because of the, the, the density that's coming into poor credit, the demand that's there and the supply can't keep up. We're not building enough. And maybe once we start getting more condos and units, like between Brightwater and Lakeview Inspiration, it's, somewhere around, I think, 9,000, 10,000 units over the next, say, 10 years. It's a lot, but it's just condos and townhouses on one piece of land. Imagine all the pieces of land in Mineola, Lauren Park, these big lots. All the 100, 50s that turn into 25s. Or even the hundreds that turn into 50s. I have 100, and I'm going to be turning them into 50s or less. Um, but there's a lot of big lots. And like the days of living on a 100 by 200 lot, that's some, that's prestige. That's, that's right. yeah, you know, and... You know, people are going to be paying, and what they're paying in Brightwater is thirteen hundred dollars, twelve to thirteen hundred dollars a square foot. Um, that's a lot of money for a condo, and they're still selling that. Eh? Oh yeah, I was going to ask you, condo uh, per square foot condo prices. Do you look at that or yeah, not? Really yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor credit, I do. Uh, not, not. So, I, I'm like, I know, I am a walking MLS for <laughs> that's, that's South Mississauga. That's why you're. That's what I am. Like, I just, I'm the walking MLS. That's what people call me. Um, so poor credit, I can tell you. you should hear what people call me. Oh yeah, <laughs> probably a big stud, <laughs> douchebag. No, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I'm sure it's it's some, some pretty good words, some pretty good. Uh, I'm just compliments. kidding. Anyways, <laughs> um, um, yeah. So um, Lakeview Inspiration is selling for out uh, for like thirteen hundred dollars to fourteen hundred dollars a square foot. That's the Tridel uh, yeah. building just sold out, and Brightwater that's sold out. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, okay. So there's phases, right? right. So the okay. first phase. Um, and the bright water inspiration, or bright water inspiration, bright water, uh, development is about $1,200 square foot, square foot. And that's at the North end of things. So you're not really getting, you're not down by the waterfront, right? So those, those will still come and those are going to sell for a lot more. We had some big sales. There's a building that import credit that was selling for 14 to $1,500 a square foot. And people bought that building and it sold out. Mm. So there is demand because the demographics are changing in poor credit. People want to maintain the lifestyle, the location, the home base, because their family or, or, or their kids are living in the area and they want to stay, but they're traveling and they don't want the big backyard anymore. They don't want the 100 by 200 foot lot. So they're buying these prestigious 
these condos I just said for fourteen fifteen hundred dollars a square foot that are selling, they're they're selling for three and a half million, four million. They're big condos, right? So, end users, and they're end users. So, buddy, that's luxury. That's your market. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. your market's getting bigger. Yeah. So, the, so this is the thing that I'm starting to you know keep my eyes on is the is the condo market, pre construction in poor credit. Let's maybe, build a condo. I'm down. Let's do it. I'm I'm looking for land. I'm actually assembling land right now for that for 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 development. So we, we will actually do business together. All right. Let's I like talk this. after this. We will talk more about it. this. is why I was so interested when I walked in here. I saw the sign outside for the redevelopment. I said, okay, we're going to have some good conversations. Yeah. We have the same, same mindset. I like it. Okay, Peter, tell our viewer and listener. Is this your mom? Or yeah, my mom, my mom, my mom, <laughs> my brother. <laughs> let them know how they can find you. So uh, I'm a real estate agent, so it's pretty easy to find me. But you know, go on Google and just type in my name, and you'll. And there's not too many Peter Phillips out there, right? Right. So my father's name is Peter. I'm Peter. Last name's Popasek. Um, so we both have the first and same last name. I had a, the only way to differentiate because people would call in and, and they would ask for Peter Popasek, and my father would pick up the phone. And he's got this like crazy, like Arnold Schwarzenegger accent, and he'd be like. You know, this is Peter Popasek, right? And, and everyone would be so confused. They'd be like, this is not the Peter I met at the open house last weekend, right? <laughs> so, um, and uh, so, yeah, so now I use my middle name uh, to differentiate. So it's Peter Philip Popasek. And you can Google that and I will come up. There will be a PPRE team.com. Amazing website. Yeah, and we got, I, got this, I, got this, I got this really great team that's running. Um, they're helping me with my Instagram, with my social media, Instagram. Um, and, um, they're actually here and big shout out to them and industries. <laughs> well, thanks for coming, man. This was great. Marcus, thank you so much. It's great awesome. having you. We've got to do this again. Yeah, we will. 100%. All right. <laughs>